It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Xiaofei Tian, Professor of Chinese Literature at Harvard University as today's speaker. Professor Tian received her BA in Chinese Literature from Peking University in 1989, and then her PhD in Comparative Literature from Harvard University in 1998. Her research interests include Chinese literature and culture, manuscript culture, book history, the history of ideas, and world literature. Her major research field is the literature, social history, and cultural history of early medieval China. She is the author of Tao Yuan Ming and Manuscript Culture, the record of a dusty ta ta table. I was going to say a dusty tale. No, <laughs> the record of a dusty table uh, in 2005, and Beacon Fire and a Shooting Star, the literary culture of the Liang, um, a very uh, short dynasty, I guess, that lasted about 50 years in the first half of the 6th century. Her new book, Visionary Journeys, Travel Writings from Early Medieval and 19th, 19th Century China, is forthcoming from Harvard University Asia Center Press. She is currently working on a book manuscript on nostalgia for the Three Kingdoms period, as well as a study and translation of a late 19th century manuscript on the traumatic childhood memory from the Taiping Rebellion. As you can see, it's a very full um, research agenda indeed. And her presentation today is about an important 20th century Chinese writer. The title of her talk is Castrating for the People, the Structure of Violence in Hao Ran's Spring Snow, a short story. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tian. Thank you, Xiaobing. <coughs> okay. uh, thank you, Xiaobing, for the uh, uh, nice introduction. And uh, uh, my thanks also go to the uh, Center for Chinese Studies uh, for inviting me and making uh, very considerate and thoughtful arrangements for the whole trip. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here. Um, <laughs> as you can see, my classicist by training. Um, but one of the courses I have been teaching uh, in the past 10 years is called uh, Art and Violence in the Cultural Revolution. Because um, I always find the period of Cultural Revolution, that is from, um, as many of you know very well, from 1966 to 1976 uh, in mainland China, a very culturally and intellectually fascinating period. Um, so the Cultural Revolution was a violent mass movement. The worst manifestation of this violence was not or was not just physical, but also spiritual and emotional. The central argument I'd like to make in this talk today is that the Cultural Revolution represents a mass search for transparency. And that obsessive search for transparency constitutes the core of the spiritual violence of the Cultural Revolution. And yet the obsession with transparency was not something that was entirely alien to the Chinese cultural tradition. The quest for absolute openness with oneself and with the world began with the Confucian truism about a frequent daily self-examination, right? Uh, 日三行五身, I uh, examine myself you know, three times a day. Um, and um, also the Neo-Confucian emphasis on sincerity, cheng. Right. So it was perfectly embodied in the 11th century new Confucian historian and statesman Sima Guang's proud assertion. He said, quote, there's nothing I have done in my life that I cannot tell the others about. And this is a remark actually quoted by none other than Liu Shaoqi, the chairman of the People's Republic of China from 1959 to 1968 in his very famous 1939 lecture, How to Be a Good Communist, <laughs> um, So it was the ultimate deprivation of si, 
uh, a word that encompasses a range of meanings and could be used in various contexts from selfishness, 自私, and self-interest, to anything personal and private, including but not limited to private ownership of property at a material level and um, uh, private space, 私人空间, at an immaterial level and emotional level. Not incidentally, the Cultural Revolution is also known as a revolution that touches the soul, right? And the famous slogan of this period is um, that is battling hard against even the flickering of si, the thought of si in one's mind. That is, the economic system of socialism characterized by public ownership was translated into the social and the cultural realms in which anything private and personal was considered potentially subversive and must be eradicated to support the dominant ideology. There could be no opaqueness in such a social system. Everything must be transparent to allow for maximum surveillance and control. Of course, there were complicated political reasons for the movement, and these reasons have been well explored by historians uh, and political scientists, especially in the wealth of scholarly writings uh, probing the high-level political struggles within the CCP, with uh, Mao Zedong as a central figure held responsible for many of the political initiatives taken in the Cultural Revolution. But such power struggles cannot fully and adequately account for the numerous local and individual manifestations of the collective craze. Instead of the political reasons behind the movement, what I am interested in are the cultural impulses that drove the Cultural Revolution, the kind of impulses that were not only consistent with the current um, socialist ideology, but also resonated very powerfully with certain uh, persistent concerns in the Chinese tradition. And I believe that one of the best places to explore such cultural impulses is the literary narratives produced during this period. The reason I choose literary narratives is not because literature is supposed to um, hold a mirror to material practice, but because it is um, constitutive of the material practice of the age. To put it in another way, uh, literature is performative in the sense that it helps found a new social order by proclaiming it. In telling stories that are sanctioned by the party state, socialist literature helps establish norms of behavior in the People's Republic. And these stories often employ um, rhetorical strategies and narrative patterns that, um, as I will try to demonstrate today, are culturally familiar to readers on a deeper level than what is revolutionary surface might let on. I will use uh, Hao Ran's uh, short story, Spring Snow, Chunxue, as a case study. But first of all, who was Hao Ran? OK. Um, right, OK. That's, um, wait, this is, I think I skipped uh, right here, OK. Um, how do I? Current slide. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, now, so who was Hao Ran? Now, 50 years ago, this question didn't need to be asked because Hao Ran was the single most famous writer during the Cultural Revolution period. In fact, he was one of the very few writers whose books were sanctioned by the party and widely published and distributed. Hao Ran was the pen name of uh, Liang Jingguang, as you can see on, at the bottom of the uh, screen. He was born into a poor miners' family in Hebei province, uh, North China, in 1932. And he joined the Communist Party in 1948. And he published his first short story in 1956. His fiction largely focuses on the rural life in North China in the socialist construction period. And he's best known for his novels, Bright Sunny Sky um, and The Gra uh, Great Road of Golden Light. 
Okay, so yeah, uh, the bright sunny sky, yeah, Yang Tian, and uh, uh, the golden, the great golden road, um, that's uh, Jingguang Da Dao, the great road of golden light. And both novels sold millions of copies in the 1960s and the 1970s. And then they were both made into movies in the 1970s. Okay, you can see the, uh, the posters of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, two movies. Um, made in the 1970s. And so this helped turn Hao Ran into a household name in mainland China. A post-cultural revolution saying quite aptly sums up the state of literature and Hao Ran's dominance uh, of the literary realm at the time, right? Uh, that is, um, 800 million people shared eight model operas, and Hao Ran marched on the road of golden light. So, this is quite apt kind of summary of the state of things in the 1960s, 1970s in terms of literature and art. After the Cultural Revolution was over, Hao Ran was largely neglected by the literary world, as could be expected. Um, the immediate reason was political. Uh, he had been Jiang Qing, that is Madame Mao's uh, favorite writer in the last years of the Cultural Revolution. There was actually even rumor that he was her lover. Um, there is also the obvious literary reason. Hao Ran's works are considered to be overly politicized and produced entirely according to state ideology. There is another important reason, although it is never articulated as such. That is, his writings are too rustic. Not in the sense that he almost exclusively wrote about peasant life. After all, you know, peasant life, rural life is often the subject matter of many, um, you know, Chinese writers and poets throughout the centuries. But in the sense that, you know, he was writing from within peasants as a peasant himself, instead of as a gentleman observer standing on the outside peeping in. And yet even his uh, harshest critics begrudgingly admit that Hao Ran is a master of a vivacious and earthy style that, at its best, proves quite effective in capturing the local colors of northern Chinese rural life. After a brief period of silence in the early 1980s, Hao Ran continued to write and publish. So his last novel, um, The Common Folk, Cang Sheng, was awarded a special prize for the first Chinese Popular Literature Award in 1990, uh, Da Zhong Wen Xue um, I think uh, that's what it's called in Chinese. And one of the most interesting works in his last years was an autobiography based on his uh, oral account. He was too ill, I think, uh, to be able to write that uh, memoir and autobiography on his own. So he caused some stir in an interview he did in 1998 in Global Global Times, Huan Qiu Shi Bao, a daily newspaper produced under the auspices of the official CCP newspaper, the People's Daily, Renmin Ri Bao, focusing on international issues. In the interview, he famously declared, uh, he said, I'm, um, you can see the Chinese here on the screen, and I'm going to read the English translation. Something like, I'm neither a pestilent insect nor a crawling bug. I'm a soldier of literature, albeit a wo wounded soldier, who has made whatever contribution he could. So far, I have never regretted what I had written. On the contrary, I'm proud of them. Um, he died in 2008. So, Spring Snow, the short story I'm going to discuss today, was written in 1976, towards the very end of the Cultural Revolution. Um, so, Tun Xue, right? Um, I'm showing what I'm showing you is actually is an illustration uh, done by one of my undergraduate students, Judith Huang, the English major class of 2010. And uh, somehow that uh, class I was teaching the art and violence and cultural revolution inspired the two students taking the class to uh, two students who are very creative and artistic to do illustrations on how as Chun Xue something sort of <laughs> kind of seemed to stir their fancy about the story. Um, so. Um, this is a story very much about the relentless quest for transparency and the violence of such a quest. While its plot is fairly simple, it is structured in such a way that the structure itself becomes part of the message the author wants to convey. 
Like a detective story, it begins with a mystery and a question. As the story unfolds, the reader is drawn deeper and deeper into the process of discovery until the riddle is completely solved at the very end. So the story opens with a scene of spring snow in a rustic uh, northern uh, landscape. A jeep from Beijing with the narrator, I, um, and the driver in it uh, is speeding on the road. It is interesting that throughout the story, we're never given to know who the narrator is, what he's doing, and where he is going. Okay, so in fact, there is very little indication of the narrator's gender in the story, except for one passing mention of his uh, smoking, which is a trait usually associated with men, um, rightly or wrongly, but there is an unmistakable air of authority about him, this narrator, um, and it's hinted at by the fact that he's sitting in a chauffeured Jeep setting out from Beijing in those days. Not everybody could have a chauffeured Jeep, you know, and also departing from Beijing, the capital and the center of the uh, People's Republic. And also this um, air of authority is conveyed by the narrator's self-conscious reference to his sense of political responsibility, um, As we read on, we realize it's important for the narrator um, to establish through the implied importance of uh, political identity, both narrative anonymity and authority. So he is the I, right? You know, that is the first person pronoun I, but also the I that watches. He's a spectator whose only actions throughout the story is watching. And yet it is exactly his watching that bestows on him power and control. As we will see, there are several layers of watching in the story, which is all about achieving insight that penetrates the deceptive surface of things and gets at the truth underneath. So watching is the first thing the narrator tells us he does in the story. Uh, he said he looks outside through the car window, and he notices in a snow-covered landscape something like a ball of fire, ball of flame rolling down over the hill ridge and then disappearing from view. Soon afterwards, he sees that a ball of fire again flashing through a grove of date trees, and he begins to um, speculate on this strange sight uh, when the jeep comes to a sudden stop and violently throws him off balance. There turns out to be a hitchhiker who stands in the middle of the road and with uh, stretching arms and blocks the progress of the Jeep. So the driver is, of course, furious. You know, it's um, not fun, you know, to be driving in a snowy condition, as we all very well know. Um, and also to have a hitchhiker, you know, so desperate, so, 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 hit, you know, reckless. And so the driver is furious, and initially he refuses the request. Then not before the driver exchanges several angry remarks with the hitchhiker does the narrator discover that the hitchhiker is a young woman. Okay. So this episode sets the tone for the entire story. We have a whole bunch of very active verbs about looking, observing, and discovering. And the narrator repeatedly uses um, you know, sentences such as, only then did I find out, or only then did I see clearly. 这时候我才发现, or 这时候我才看清, to indicate a belated recognition of what really is beneath appearance. Significantly, the girl, the hitchhiker, is hard to recognize in terms of, um, first of all, gender. Right? Her, she's wearing a peach red plastic raincoat, but that is about the only thing that's conventionally feminine about her. And even here, of course, the symbolism of red as a revolutionary and a progressive color is a determining factor. So the, uh, the portrayal of girl goes, uh, goes like this. Uh, she has a, um, quote, dark complexion, and uh, narrow, elongated eyes, hands that are not very big, but with thick, calloused fingers. And she wears a pair of old sneakers, but no socks. Now the conclusion drawn by the narrator from this detailed observation is that, um, Quote, she's a peasant girl from the mountain village, and, and a quote, and leads him to immediately forgive her reckless behavior and enjoin the right driver to give her a ride. 
I will come back to the issue of gender and social class, and the significance of the change in the narrator's attitude from irritation to sympathy. But for now, let me just say that the girl's eccentric behavior, just like her gender, is not immediately transparent. She shows no interest in chit chat、uh, when the narrator tries to be friendly and start a conversation, and she cuts him off rather rudely. And yet she was angry. You know, she's angrily muttering to herself、uh, mysterious things that the narrator finds completely incomprehensible, but also very provocative.、Uh, for example, when she sees a man wearing yellow oil cloth raincoat riding a bicycle on the road,、uh, she would say things such as, "What a scoundrel! What a scoundrel!" I guessed right. He has indeed come this way today. You know,、uh, something like this. 小子多坏 right? <laughs> And then something drops from her pocket, a small, oddly shaped knife that glistens like snow. When the narrator asks her why she carries a knife around, she answers coldly, "This is a weapon. This is a weapon." Okay, so then she declares she has reached her destination, shouts out to the driver to stop, and leaps out of the jeep and hurries away. Intrigued by what he sees and hears, the narrator discusses with the driver and decides that he should follow the girl around while the driver files report at the local police station about a certain suspicious person. Okay, so as if to ward off any potential accusation of、um, nosiness, the narrator now stresses that. He's not acting upon idle curiosity, but because of quote an inescapable sense of political responsibility. <laughs> okay, he states quote I made up my mind to get a total clarification about this person and to never allow a serious incident such as this to slip away from under my eyes. Right end of quote. So what happens next is a series of unveiling of the mystery of the girl. First, the narrator loses track of her in the crowd in the village marketplace. Then he overhears a conversation between two men. Okay,、um, the conversation goes something like this:、um, One man was saying, "Hurry up, let's go take a look at this novel show." Another says, "Really? I've never seen anything like this all my life." And then another man said, "That woman is really something. One at each cut." <laughs> and then the other man said, "Wow, she really has the guts to do that." And so the narrator intuitively feels that they're talking about the very girl he's chasing. So he follows their footsteps and squeezes his way through a thick crowd of onlookers. He sees red, <laughs> literally. First, it's the girl's red raincoat, and then he sees red blood on the ground. Okay, so he hears the wailing of a pig. He finally realizes what is going on. With the help of an old woman, this girl she is、uh, following is castrating piglets for the villagers. Okay, so here I want to put in a note of、um, explanation of pig castration.、Uh, pig castration is universal in swine production all over the world, right? Even though some European countries、um, have, I heard, have begun to ban it、uh, only just very recently, I think in 2009.、Um, typically, only a select few boars, that is male pigs, are left intact for breeding purpose. There are two reasons for castrating a, a boar, a male pig. So、uh, behavioral and Economical, right? So boars tend to become very aggressive as they reach sexual maturity. They engage in fights and can injure themselves. Castrated boars are much more docile,、um, sweeter, and easier to handle. And more importantly, they're fatter and produce meat that doesn't have a strong odor and flavor, commonly known as the、uh, the boar taint. So the method of castrating piglets is is rather brutal. I'm not going to <laughs> go into it.、Um, <laughs> But if you're curious, you can easily find、uh, tons of materials, of course, on the、um, internet, and including YouTube <laughs> videos. <laughs>、um, and uh, now, carrying out.、Um, So it's, it's chi in Chinese it's called the Qiao Zhu, and here's a kind of a, a painting representing, uh, uh, you know, the.、Uh, uh, The operation of of castrating a pig, piglet.、Um, so carrying out this pig castration involves training and skill, and no subtle handling. For unlike in other animals or humans, a piglet's testicles are internal and have to be felt and then pulled out by hand. Okay, traditionally this had been largely a man's profession. 
Hence, the villagers are surprised at seeing a young woman do the work in Hao Ran's story, and a large crowd begin to gather around. You know, gather together to watch. Okay, so. The story doesn't end here. The narrator, while feeling relieved that the eccentric girl is not a criminal, that is, you know, not against humans, <laughs> he he still wonders about her angry muttering upon seeing the cyclist,、um, you know, on the road. So at this moment, he overhears another conversation. He's always eavesdropping, overhearing things, <laughs> and so.、Um, A bearded man with two piglets under his arms is chatting with a middle-aged man wearing a gray、uh, polyester overcoat lined with sheepskin. You can see the、um, the Chinese on the screen while I read out the English translation. So the bearded man with two piglets under his arms is saying something like, "I heard that demoted old bureau chief has been rehabilitated." Well, it was I who had founded this country along with my comrades. Whoever wants to take power away from my hands, impossible.、Um, rest assured, anyone who has defended me and supported me will have a place. How could he be left as a、um, spectator? Wonderful, wonderful. Whenever you have time, come to stay a few days in our village. You got to do me a favor. Sure, sure. That son of yours has made a contribution. He got demoted for no reason. Wasn't it just because he had an affair with some woman? Um, tell him to stand upright again. He got me behind him. By the way, what are you doing here with the pigs? So the conversation now is switched to pig castrating. The middle-aged man in gray overcoat told the bearded man. Um, to go to a doctor Huang, okay, Huang Yisheng, instead of going to that girl. So the girl has come from, you know, according to this、um, middle,、uh, according to this middle-aged man in gray overcoat. So the girl has come from a poor peasant family, and is a crazy woman, Feng Feng Zi, 女疯子 who dreams of becoming a female expert, 女专家 in which、um, her craziness lies is left unexplained. That a descendant of peasants who had been poor and un Educated for generations, could become expert, 专家 of any kind, or that a woman could ever become expert,、um, you know,、um, you know,、um, of any kind, or you know, rather than a poor peasant, or a woman could become an expert of any kind, or both. So we we don't know, you know, why she's a mad woman, you know, for wanting to become a 女专家 So. Uh, Doctor Huang, on the other hand, has come from a family specializing in the profession for generations. It turns out that Doctor Huang is the very cyclist to whom the narrator and the girl have seen on their way. A co- closer look at him reveals him to be a man around 30 years old,、uh, with eyeglasses for deep nearsightedness, in a smart uniform, and skillfully handling the surgical knife. After he finishes castrating a piglet, he would raise his head and、uh, quote cordially smiles at the pig owner. So the courtesy and the professionalism of the male doctor form a very sharp contrast with the peasant girl, who's uncouth from her clothes to her manners and needs an old woman to help keep the piglet down. So Doctor Huang attracts all the customers away, and a new crowd forms around him. But as soon he gets into a tiff with the bearded man over payment, at this moment the girl calls out,、um, "Comrades, commune members, come over here! Let me castrate your piglets!" Just as people murmuring with surprise about her business sense and brashness, she explains that she wants to help develop swine production for the country, and so she is offering castration for free. <laughs> and that, and that she will be happy to repay anyone with a new piglet if she botches a job. And now at this point, a plump middle-aged woman onlooker serves as her commentator, saying,、uh, "Quote: This girl here is serving the people, 为人民服务 She does not want people's money. 她不是为了人民币 Okay. <laughs> so. Now, lest a cynical reading interprets the girl's victory over Doctor Huang as a consequence of the people's desire to save money, the story has two advocates, the plump woman and a young man, come out and testify to the skill of the girl. Something like, you know, not a single piglet she castrated has died, and also testifying to her moral superiority. You know, for example, she used her own family's piglets for training and experimentation, and she was a good、uh, five. 
good student, you know, the Wuhao uh, Xue Sheng at the uh, veterinary school. Thus, with all this emphasis on selflessness, the story establishes a clear economy. If the commune members put their bet on the girl, it is all gain in both moral and financial terms. But if they put their bet on Dr. Huang, they will lose not just their hard-earned money, but also their moral capital. Although clearly no capitalist roader the girl nevertheless needs advertisement. She herself, on the other hand, gives a very bad rap, you know, the negative advertisement to her com competitor by pointing out uh, in public that instead of doing his proper job as the state-paid uh, veterinarian, Dr. Huang has falsely asked for a sick leave from the commune and is now trying to make personal profit with his skills in the marketplace. So the reader, like the villagers at the marketplace, is faced with two choices and must choose wisely. The choices imply more grave political consequences in contemporary context in 1976. Behind the conversation uh, earlier cited be between the bearded man and the man in the gray overcoat about the rehabilitation of an old bureau chief uh, looms a large political story. So we know that the last campaign, the Cultural Revolution, was the so-called Feng to strike against the rightist deviationist wind to overthrow correct verdicts, and that rightist deviationist referred to uh, none other than Deng Xiaoping, who had been rehabilitated in 1973 to help put China back on track, both politically um, and economically. Now, Deng Xiaoping's very pragmatic economic policy and his disapproval of the Cultural Revolution finally drew uh, Mao Zedong's ire, who decided that Deng was, after all, a capitalist roader, and that there was a struggle between two lines, between socialist orthodoxy and capitalism. So Hao Ran's story may be read as a fictional realization of this struggle between the two lines. It creates and operates within a perfect symmetry with the anonymous and thus literally selfless girl and the selfish Dr. Huang representing two opposite ideological directions and two different value systems, one good and one evil. But underneath this immediately resonant political message, the real lesson of the story is a lesson about reading and interpretation. And this is where the true interest, I think, of the story lies. Nothing is what it seems in the story. So the uncouth peasant girl turns out um, to be a very public-minded young woman with a warm heart, and the polished, smiling doctor turned out to be a cold profit seeker. A recurring word in the story is guess or speculate, cai. Okay, so the girl claims that she has guessed Dr. Huang's uh, moves, and the narrator keeps guessing Tsai at the girl. Even upon finding out that she's a pig castrator, he still wonders about her motives. Um, he's, you know, thinking to himself, is she doing this for fame, uh, or is she doing this for money? So his following of the girl mirrors and parallels the girl's pursuit of Dr. Huang. So each is tracking down a suspicious person out of a so-called inescapable sense of political responsibility. The chase ends in the final uncovering of truth for the narrator and for the reader who reads through his eyes, right? So both Dr. Huang and the girl reveal their true identities, motives, personal histories, family backgrounds, layer upon layer, until the narrator learns everything about them, you know, including the girl being the younger sister of the party secretary of a middle school in the city, a seemingly gratuitous detail, but proving her entire family is red and trustworthy and thus completing her personal um, official file. While the narrator seems content with discovering truth for himself, the girl is determined to expose Dr. Huang's true nature in public. She's ruthless in her persecution of the man, and he laments pitifully, do you have to wipe me out like this? You wanted to show off at Jiang Fu Shan and ruin my business, and I yielded to you and left for Duan Jialing. But before I could establish myself in Duan Jialing, you again followed me to Duan Jialing, so I have to now hide in such an out-of-the-way place. Place. But you, where do you want me to push me now? 
The girl replied, stressing every word like a sharp axe chopping at wood. We want to push you till you completely collapse. We will not leave even one inch of space for you to carry on your dirty business. <laughs> And she takes him to the marketplace management, um, so so that, as she said, people here will all recognize your true face, 认识认识你的本来面目 But the man in gray overcoat turns out to be in charge of the marketplace management committee, and he defends Doctor Huang. So the girl finally decides to go and appeal to the country, ah,、uh, to the county committee, to the Xianwei. So the narrator's driver, who's initially unsympathetic to the girl and reluctant to take her on as a passenger, now steps forward and offers a ride to the girl to the county. I think the key word here is expose. Okay, either 揭发 or 揭露 or 暴露 one of the most common terms used in the Cultural Revolution period. No one could hide or escape. Everyone must constantly, compulsively watch out for hidden threat, hidden class enemy, and hidden motive in others as well as in oneself. In close association with the imperative to expose is the necessity for labeling clearly defined identities in a rigidly classified society on a must. So there were the so-called red five categories, 红五类 or black five categories, 黑五类 black seven categories, 黑七类 and the stinky old nice, right, the 臭老九 the nickname for、uh, intellectuals in a ranking system from one to nine. So. Not that there was no so-called social mobility. Some young people were considered children who could be reformed through education, 可以教育好的子女 Right? For anyone who's familiar with the nine rank system, 九品中正制 of early medieval China, this is nothing short of a modern recreation of the medieval social hierarchy in an ostensibly egalitarian socialist regime. So the tradition, the very target of elimination in the Cultural Revolution, resurfaced, but there is a significant permutation. While the medieval social hierarchy that separated the gentry and the commoners was a matter of political and economic privileges, in the modern caste system, a person's class status is used to determine his or her ideological inclination and moral quality. So the modern hierarchy therefore becomes a point of departure in the penetration into a person's innermost world. During the Cultural Revolution,、uh, struggle sessions or struggle meetings, 斗争会 involved making class enemies go on stage and wear a dance cap, you know, a dancer's cap.、Uh, for example, something like this. As you can see, this man is uh, uh, being made to wear this very,、um, you know, kind of a high, you know, sort of pointed dancer's cap. Uh, or a plaque with his or her name and、uh, identity written on it.、Uh, for example, like in this picture,、uh, this guy, you know, in the struggle session, right, a class enemy whose name is obviously Li Fan Wu with a kind of a cross on his name. Also, he's identified as a 黑帮分子 a black element. And incidentally, there's an evil piglet <laughs> being painted on the、uh, on the plaque as well to indicate, I guess, his 本来面目 right, his True face is true nature.、Um, now, since a dancer's cap or a plaque is not a permanent part of a person's physical appearance, a more ingenious method was invented to describe difference directly on one's body by giving a class enemy a different. A、uh, hairstyle, such as a cross-shaped cut, a 十字头 or 阴阳 haircut,、uh, so named because the hair on one side of the person's head is shaven off. So you know, because it's it's with a, it's just like the <laughs> red scarlet letter. You know, you can always take it off, and then you become you know totally kind of、uh, intransparent again. So by Shaving off your hair, then you know you can't really easily hide it. Even though one intellectual and you know Yang Jiao did try to do so by wearing a wig, but even then, you know she was very easily recognized by highly vigilant revolutionaries on the street, right? <laughs>、um, 
Um, now, in Haoran's story, structured as a quest for transparency, the signs are just as physical as a dancer's cap, a plaque, or an insulting hairstyle. The girl in red, the doctor in yellow, and the man in gray overcoat are set against a white, wintry landscape, with each color indicating the true nature of the person. And in accordance with the levels of their moral caliber, each piece of clothing is they're wearing is more opaque than the other. So from the girl's translucent plastic raincoat to Dr. Huang's oilcloth raincoat, and finally to the market committee chair's overcoat with sheepskin lining, which distinctly recalls the saying about a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? So opaqueness indicates concealment. And any deliberate concealment points to something that needs to be hidden, which in a world that demands absolute transparency could only mean treachery and deceit. In order for transparency and clarity to be maintained, the world must be essentially sterile and static, because procreation and growth mean change, and the change is messy. The girl plays a key role in upholding the stasis at the expense of productivity. The story's title is Spring Snow. Spring is the season of things growing, emerging, and coming out. Uh, the story actually opens with a very pastoral description, uh, as you can see from the uh, um, on the on the slide. Apricot trees were budding red. Willow branches were producing tender shoots. Wheat sprouts were stretching in the earth. A noisy spring was just on the threshold. Who would have thought that at such a season it would suddenly snow? Now, in the Jeep, the narrator has tried to start a conversation with the girl by commenting on the weather. Uh, and he says something like, I say, a snow like this in spring will surely damage the crops, no? Um, that depends on how you look at it. Spring snow can kill off any pestilent insects that are hiding in corners and are preparing to come back to life. So soon we realize the girl without a name or surname, unlike both of the inactive characters in the story, Dr. Huang and the market committee chair, uh, Comrade Chen. Um, now, she's the title heroine. She's both spring and snow. Right? She's young, energetic, and her movement resembles that of a light and a nimble swallow, as the uh, narrator says, and her raincoat is of the color of peach blossom. So she's kind of like, you know, represents spring. But at the same time, she's described as cold, angry, fierce. Her surgical knife glistened like snow, and she ground her teeth, yao ya jie chi, upon seeing Dr. Huang, and she's like a sharp ax chopping away at wood. And her raincoat is also of the color of a ball of fire that burns. And ultimately, it echoes the red blood of the pigs spilled on the ground in the marketplace. There's no mistake that she's castrating and destructive. And the piglets are not the only victims of castration in this story. Dr. Huang, whose face turns um, as yellow as wax upon seeing the girl, is clearly one of the pestilent insects to be exterminated. While she represents the revolutionary and the proletariat, he, the Dr. Huang, with his eyeglasses, uh, neat uniform, and courteous manners, represents the old elite intellectual class that must be always vigilantly watched over and spiritually castrated, so that they could be quieter, more docile, and easier to handle, just like the male pigs. <laughs> I just want to show you the, uh, uh, the, my student's illustration. And uh, um, in her illustration, she actually turned the dialogue overheard by the narrator between the two men to a dialogue between two pigs. <laughs> she feels that the pig's perspective is very much neglected So, <laughs> in the story. So here, the, uh, remember the two men were saying that the Zhen the Zhen Li, Hai, Yi Dao Zi Ge, that woman is really something, one each cut. Wow, she really has a guts to do it. Now she kind of transforms that into a dialogue <laughs> between two pigs, and I think that's very ingenious. Um, now, <clears throat> it is significant that Dr. Huang and the marketplace manager are both male. 
while the pig castrator is a young woman, and even her helper is a woman as well. To be sure, the maleness of the negative characters brings home the castration metaphor. But having a woman perform the job, um, I think, is a little bit of an overkill that deserves <laughs> our attention. Now, the gender configuration serves an ideological need much deeper than the ostensible exhibition of socialist feminism, which always holds that women can do any job as well as men. You know, the, um, now, the femaleness of the pig castrator is a necessity because the girl is set up to represent the marginalized social class rebelling against its oppressors and trying to rise in hierarchy. And no one could better fulfill that symbolic function than a woman from a poor peasant family who is doubly underprivileged in terms of both class and gender. So to be made a rebel against authority, however, um, this is a kind of a double-edged sword because to be made a rebel against authority means that she can never gain real authority, true authority, because as long as her power comes from resistance and a rebellion, she's doomed to remain marginal. In fact, positions of social, political, and medical authority in this story are all occupied by men, such as the manager, Dr. Huang, the narrator himself, uh, whose attitude towards a girl remains patronizing throughout the story. Things like, you know, I immediately forgive her. She's just a peasant girl, you know. Um, and also even the driver who operates a motor vehicle while the girl is going around on foot. Um, so the girl is celebrated on account of her opposition to them. With, but you know, the catch here is that without those men in authority positions, without anything to resist and rebel against, she is nothing. Right? So this is a feminism that demands, by virtue of the narrative function, a fundamental asymmetry and inequality between women and men. Um, Okay, I'm going to um, wrap up here. So the only out of place character in the story um, is the narrator, uh, the omnipresent eye that watches everyone's moves. And this is an illustration from the other student in my class who was uh, doing a comic, adapted the story uh, to be a comic book. And this is the cover. And I feel like it really captures the spirit of the struggle sessions and the Cultural Revolution uh, period. Uh, and here, this you can see this uh, uh, that man in the crowd with an arrow pointing to his head. He's supposed to be the narrator. And the girl is kind of, uh, you know, pointing pointing her finger to the very much wizard Dr. Huang in the, in the corner. Now, the thing about narrator is that, well, everyone else eventually succumbs to the quest for transparency and sheds his or her disguise as the narrative progresses. The narrator alone remains opaque uh, till the very end. So we never know who he is, what he's doing, and where he is going. Being chauffeured around in the jeep originating from Beijing, he's in some ways a good allegory of the central government in a totalitarian regime, right? the authority figure that scrutinizes and monitors everyone, but itself refuses to be monitored and scrutinized. The narrator is in some ways a projection of Hao Ran himself in real life, who lived and worked in Beijing for more than 20 years, but constantly went back to his roots in Hebei province, uh, his hometown, and eventually moved back to Hebei in 1977 after the Cultural Revolution was over. But in some ways, he comes closer to being identified with the girl in the story than with anyone else. Just like the girl, Hao Ran himself was from a peasant family that had been impoverished and uh, undereducated or probably uneducated for generations. Despite the critical claim he received in the 1960s and 1970s, because of his background and more important, the literary choices he made as a writer, he was never really part of the elite literati Wen Ren that had enjoyed a long tradition of privileges in China. He was, in his own words, a peasant with his roots in the countryside who wrote about peasants for peasants. He was certainly no Shakespeare or Toy Story. Nevertheless, he was very good at what he did. His stories are like Chinese paper cuts, 
two-dimensional simple with a penchant for symmetry and full of a, a rustic and folksy charm. If we must identify a literary president for Hao Ran, then I would say that he was writing in the tradition of Chinese theater with his role types. Each role type, uh, xing, is prescribed and marked with distinguished makeup and costume. To in if you watch Peking Opera, you know what I mean. To indicate a character's identity, right? A beautiful maiden, or a stalwart hero like Hao Han, or a talented young man like Cai Zi, or a villain, or a clown. Wow. So Hao Ran's Spring Snow works just like a Peking opera play with its visual cues, as the girl in red, the doctor in yellow, and the manager in gray form a carefully posed tableau against the snowy landscape. Everyone's identity is predetermined by family background. There's no possibility for change or complications. It is an extremely neat, simple, and oppressive social vision. And Hao Ran himself both benefited from such a social vision and was ultimately trapped by it. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, last, I want to show you a picture from my personal photo collection. Hao Ran is in the front row, fifth from right, among a group of writers and editors of Tianjin. This picture was taken, I think, around 1983. And uh, I was a little girl in the middle there, <laughs> in the front row. <laughs> so I had no idea who he was, <laughs> and had certainly never read his uh, stories or fiction at the time <laughs> when the picture was taken. Hmm? I was uh, I was writing poetry at the time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.